I'm ready. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another geopoetic conversation with me. I am Dr. Rob Francis, and, and I'm part of the lecturing team uh, for the creative and professional writing here at the University of Wolverhampton. Uh, and this forms part of my project, the Chain Choral Chorus, which has been enabled by the uh, Doctoral College Early Research Award Scheme that's uh, put me in the position of poet in residence for the Black Country Geological Society. And a big part of this project is to commission uh, four writers to give their reactions to the Black Country Geopark and some of the significant sites in the Black Country Geopark uh, and uh, to, to think about place and identity and community in these sort of unusual deep time ways. And I'm really thrilled to have my third guest poet and blogger with me today, the very excellent Liz Berry. Hi Liz, how are you? Hi, very well. I'm good, thank you. Good, excellent. Um, so let's just get cracking straight into our geopoetic conversation then. Can you tell everybody where you went? And uh, what struck you as interesting there? I went to Warsaw Arboretum and I chose the Arboretum. It's a place I went lots when I was a child and a teenager. And I'd sort of been an admirer for years without realising that it had any geological significance. It was very beloved to me because of the illuminations. And we used to go there a lot with my dad. He used to work at social services in Warsaw. But until I saw it listed in the Geo Park site, I had no idea it actually had any geological significance in the area. I see. And, and, and what did you find out about the geological significance there? Well, I was very fascinated. There's actually a lot of detail now in the Arboretum about its mm. geological significance, about the limestone. I had no idea that it was built on um, limestone quarries, that it had been a liming site and then it flooded became a sort of a private park after people were unofficially swimming in it constantly and then it became a public park how it sort of how it's fitted the shape of the town over the years reflected everything from sort of this Victorian desire for improving public spaces through to things like the Joseph Leckie um, Centre for Older Gentlemen through to the play park that I went with my little son and I was I found it really beautiful to know that a site that had once been an outdoor lido was now the playground with a splash park. So it's almost as if all the time in the Arboretum you can see the layers of what's there before but updated. So the playground's still called Treasure Island and we discovered that was because that was the name of, of the lido. So they've kept it with a pirate theme. It was beautiful in the visitor centre. You can sort of see it back through the years to see sort of kids there a long, long time ago um, splashing around in the exact same site that, that we were when we went. That's so lovely. And, uh, and I think this is one of the things that's really typical of these sorts of black country environments. I know me and you have spoken previously about places like the Rena of it being this sort of quintessentially black country space. And I think something that the Geo Park sites have got in common is that you're immediately tuned into these peculiar layers of signs and symbols and meanings and echoes. And and the the word echo seems to be really pertinent to the poem that you produced and, and the blog that you produced as well. Echoes of place, echoes of hauntings of lost people and previous people and then these layers and echoes of family that go through it as well so maybe you could talk a little bit about that and, and how the poems started to form and develop as you as you went around this site yeah, of course I, I visited the arboretum with my son who's four and this is something that I talk about in the blog that when you visit a place with a little child especially your own little child you're really aware of the different layers of place because often with a little child you're down quite low but they're really interested in kind of excavating the soil and the yeah. earth. Yeah, they're, they're natural seeing. geologists. They are, they're climbing on things, they're in the little cracks in the secret places 
And I think because it was the place I visited a lot as a child with my dad and, and my mum. I think you then also become really aware of the layers of time to visit somewhere where you've been a child and now you're a parent with your own child. That's sort of a beautiful, quite an eerie feeling to think about mm. what's changed, what's what's different. So I became very fascinated by this idea of layering, which I think is there in, in the geology too, not just the layers of the land and of the soil and the rock, but the layers of time. The layers of our bodies even what you know what moving from the outside to to the inside to the internal and because it's the arboretum it's got these really amazing trees and and i was sort of very curious about what they might think of it all do you know the layers of a tree to move from the outside you know these big huge rough barks right through to the really tender secret bit that they might somehow be trying to communicate with us in, in not an entirely benevolent way either. Mm. I think all, all sort of parks and public spaces, especially ones that have sort of spread out and gone a bit wild in places, have got have got that feeling of, of ambivalence, as if they might have some secrets or thoughts or opinions that they, they don't want to share with us or necessarily include us in in a benevolent way. So that was where it came from really. Although I did laugh because before I visited the Arboretum again, I was looking it up on the map to just see where it lay in relation to the land. And then um, there was a brilliantly scathing review of it from somebody, uh, sort of an interested tree expert that had visited. And what did she say about it now? It was more a park than a true Arboretum. Oh, wow. actually, I loved it for that because when I read back into the layers of the history, actually the name was kind of a misnomer, it was just a park. But the idea of arboretums was really popular at the time when it was named the Arboretum. So it's almost like they borrowed this grand name for it. And over the years, it, it's kind of started to live up to its grandness. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and then there is a sense that it's kind of come into its own by living up to its grandness as well, you're right. And perhaps that's part, part of that is the way that it's managed to cling on to its roots as a tree would, but develop as well. So it's still got the Lido, but it's a slightly different version of it. Um, in the same way that the geology kind of underpins the culture that comes out of it as well. It's really, really fascinating. Um, you know, I've, I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed and I've been revisiting the poem since you sent it to me a few times i love this sense that the trees kind of welcome us in but it's not quite a sort of an, a, a grandparent's hug of a welcome it's a sort of come if you're curious sort <laughs> of welcome. um i wish we get in quite a lot of your work anyway um and and i think something that people keep coming back to your work for as well uh, that sense of tease um, and something that's, I don't know, it, it's sort of welcoming and potentially threatening in equal measure as well. And there's a sort of, there's, there's, that, there's that ambivalence that you spoke about in, in these sorts of parks um, that we get in these places more generally as well as, isn't there that they're sort of they're very homely and, and lovely and uh full of lush flora and fauna and, and, and all of that kind of heritage that the black country is so famous for but also litter and needles and threats and gangs and you know that's always on the edge as well isn't it i think something that really compelled me rob it's quite an eerie thing hmm. was that there's two there's two lakes or pools at the Arboretum. And when we visited, it's so beautifully laid out now, there's lots of visitor information on these gorgeous kind of silver leaves embedded in the ground. And I was shocked at how deep the pools are because they're made out of the old quarries, the old lime workings. One of the pools is 50 foot deep and the other is 80 foot deep. Wow. Which I just something sort of absolutely terrifying about that and apparently all over the years there's been so many drownings in the pools because they're in this kind of park that's so close to the town it's really well loved it's full of kids and mums and people walking their dogs 
you imagine them to be very shallow and very safe, like you could just jump in there for a lock on a hot day, but it's the thought that actually it's 80 foot deep in there and underneath there's these line workings. There's something a bit shivery about that, that, that yeah. kind of haunts the arboretum. Yeah, and again, it's one of those sort of abject things or uncanny things that's that you, you, you're as curious about as you are sort of disgusted or repulsed or put off by as well. And, and that's sort of, there's that sort of clashing connection that we get in part of your blog as well. Well, in the poem itself as well. I'm just checking my notes here. But um, th there's a sense of that you, in in the blog, you mentioned in a paragraph uh, about buried being the wrong word because it, it's, there's a sense of it being dead and it's not quite dead or it's not dead at all it's it's living but it's been beneath the surface um and i wonder whether you could say something about this this things within these environments that appear inert or appear or, or, or are things that you might just pass by without even recollection but are actually vibrantly alive and in in terms of your metaphor of the lakes, like profoundly deep and dangerous and gorgeous all at equal measure. I think you really feel that sense of it being alive in the Arboretum now. And I wonder if that's partly because it's so tree filled. Mm. The, the trees, they've got, you know, they're very old. They've seen a lot of those trees, a lot of changes, a lot of conflict, joy illumination yeah. um, and they're still vibrant you know we can see that in the season change but actually I think the way that the park's been developed gives this really heightened awareness of the past or of what's hidden or buried being alive so the way the park's been developed now all around you've got these sort of beautiful silver leaves and sculptures and sort of little paths to guide you that talk to you about about the social history of the park, the geological history, things that happened. So all the time you're really aware of, of sort of the historical layers as well as the geological ones. And I think that's something that sort of really surprised me about the site, how it seemed to want to keep alive everything that happened in the past and sort mm. of carry carry that collective memory, that, that kind of land memory into people's current experience of it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, so in the same way that the kind of the rings of the tree tell us its age, but also tell it about its the circumstances in which it's grown. So too, the sort of stratigraphic layers of the land underneath it, and then there is something happening socially or culturally or within the phenomena of that location that that's building and webbing out and adding to the layers. Um, and that's a very, very sort of geopoetic or geological process of thinking as well, I think, as well as it being a poetic one. Um, how did you find the sort of placing the geological lens into your work this time around? Did that aid or scupper or put any kind of restrictions on you? No, I found it really fascinating. I've not really thought in that way before, even though I think a lot about the kind of landscape of the Black Country. So actually before I went to the Arboretum, I read up quite a lot on the geology of it. So that kind of almost like that was in my mind. Yeah. Going round already, you're, you're kind of thinking about what sort of what's underneath and the layers of it. And I think I was really fascinated by the fact that maybe this is true of of much of the black country it's in, for me it's impossible to separate the areas of uh, wildness or nature from the social and cultural aspects of it and yeah. especially the part of Britain is kind of penned in all around by Warsaw and you're really aware of the ring like the ring road or this really busy big road going around the outside that you're aware of the people and the people who've been there and what the space was kept for and actually how amazing that that huge space has kind of been preserved and survived and I was talking with my mum about it and we were liking it to places like Bagridge um, and he said it used to be an old colliery and is now this beautiful old you know wild nature reserve really popular with kids and families and it's amazing 
how all the time though in the midst of that kind of green and wildness you can't forget the kind of social cultural industrial pressure that was put upon the land I think that that sort of always feels really present in the black country I don't know if it feels like that for you yeah I, I completely echo that yeah I, it's definitely been my experiences of going around places like Baggeridge, Sedgley Beacon, Cotwell End you know so many of the geo sites have got that that spirit in common I mean I just this weekend, I ran a writing workshop at Bantock House, which is another sort of less obvious geo site in the same way that the Arboretum or West Park are one of the less obvious ones. Um, but you still can't help but be tripped up by that, by the, the, the weird and fusing borders of man-made and organic and rural and urban and domestic and wild and and all of those things are constantly in it, laying against each other uh, but it's, it's impossible to find out where the borders are and i think it's that interplay between things that where we start to touch on it if we want to think about the spirit of place in the black country can't quite describe what it is but it's Something about the gymnastics between those things, I think. <laughs> I love that word, gymnastics. And I think all that, like, it's something like the Arboretum, and actually probably a lot of the geo sites you described, the ones that feel kind of more, like, maybe more domestic to us, more sort of cultivated. It's actually the idea that, that they were put aside for a purpose, that mm. they were either abandoned and then lived into a new purpose or they were put aside like the arboretum that that sort of land was put aside and then protected and when we were there it was a really sunny day and it's absolutely full of kids and and people walking their dogs and people meeting older people and I, I, I smiled myself so I was thinking it's it's sort of like the exact Victorian dream of what you would like a public park to be yeah. like a place where People that live in really urban areas come and they can experience green, they can have fresh air, they can walk, they can exercise. It sort of made me think of that sort of grand Victorian dream of, of public spaces and protecting public spaces. Yeah, absolutely. And I, 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 get similar, I, I get a similar experience at West Park in Wolverhampton as well. It's a very, you know, when you're walking over the bridges of the lakes and around the bandstands and things, you you definitely get that, wow, the, the Victorians really got that part right, <laughs> I think. Um, the other thing I want to bring up is a bit of a shared experience, well, two shared experiences, but ones that kind of come together, I guess. First of all, thank you for choosing Warsaw Arboretum, and thank you for mentioning Warsaw Illuminations uh, and Yunnan, because, uh, again, we used to go every single year as a family to Warsaw Illuminations. And my nan would have one or two too many sherries and dance down the paths and between the lights and whatever. Um, so I've got that sort of shared sense of going there once a year and it being this kind of important place and experience for family. Um, and also, because I've done so much of my work over the last 12 months has been in lockdown and whatnot. Um, Elsie, my daughter, has come along on quite a lot of my field trips as well. And so I really feel when you say about getting down at toddler level, or getting down to child level, and that you start to see things with the, with the fresh eyes that children do. It's a very, very cr uh, curious and fruitful experience for a poet isn't it? I think so because they find things really beautiful and fascinating that I would probably walk past so after we went to Warsaw Bleach we went back again and we took my mum with us and I came back with my bag stuffed full of really mangy like feathers from ducks and geese and pigeons that my son collected. <laughs> Literally loads of them like absolute hallowed treasure in my bag and it's and actually they are really beautiful you wash them and you look at them but it's the kind of thing i would walk i would walk past my eye wouldn't even go down to that level to to spot it so i think kids bring a sort of a beautiful aspect to a walk especially if you're sort of thinking about going down low looking down in, into the dirt that's one of their sort of 
great pleasures. Absolutely, yeah, definitely. Lovely. Well, I think that, that feels like quite a nice place to rest here, especially in terms of the way that your work for this project has fused the layers and time and movement of the land and the landscape with the layers and movements of family and memory and the sense of coming together of these things as well, um, which is really beautiful. And like I say, in keeping with that sort of geopoetic spirit of the way that we experience and think about our interconnectedness with the planet, with the earth and with our locales. So huge, huge thank you, Liz, for taking your time out this morning and for giving us your beautiful work, your beautiful words once again. Um, can you tell everybody before we call it quits uh, where best to find you and connect with you? Oh, you yes, you can find everything you need through my website, which is lizberrypoetry.co.uk. And there you can listen to poems, you can read poems, watch videos, listen to podcasts and find out a bit more about the work. Excellent. Thanks very much, Liz. And uh, I hope we can see each other in person sometime soon. And uh, thanks once again. I shall... Thanks, Rob. Take care.